Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and this week on JBS, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of a seminal event in the history of the State of Israel and world Jewry as well, Israel's stunning defeat of the combined Arab armies in six days of June 1967, the Jewish world stood trembling as Egyptian President Abdul Nasser went on radio and television, gave speeches before thousands of cheering masses, vowing to annihilate the Jewish state as he strove to become king of the United Arab World and in an act of cowardice, betrayal. At Nasser's command, the United Nations withdrew its peacekeeping forces, preventing Egypt from advancing on Israel through the Sinai. Without international resistance, Nasser closed the Gulf of Aqaba, choking Israel's main water trade route, and moved six army divisions of some 130,000 men into the Sinai, preparing to launch an attack against Israel, coordinated with Syria's attacking from the north and Jordan's attacking from the east. But before the attack could begin, on June 5th, 1967, Israel launched a preemptive strike, destroying virtually the entire Egyptian air force as it stood on airfields on the ground. And six days later, six days later, Israel was in control of the Golan Heights, from which Syria had been mercilessly shelling Jewish communities in the Hula Valley had secured the entire Sinai down to Sharm el-Sheikh and had liberated the old city of Jerusalem with the Western Wall and had pushed Jordan off the West Bank. In six days of June 1967, the State of Israel had come of age and world Jewry came of age as well. Before the Six-Day War, the image of the Jew, even the self-image, tended to be the old man. After the Six-Day War, the image was that of the young Israeli soldier, even a female Israeli soldier. Well, on this very special edition of L'Chaim, I have the pleasure of sitting with a wonderful panel to reflect upon the significance, impact, and long-range implications of the Six-Day War, and you know them all very well. As always, we're joined by Thane Rosenbaum, Distinguished Fellow at NYU Law School. He's the Director of the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society. He's an award-winning essayist and novelist. Rabbi Eric Yaffe is President Emeritus of the Union for Reform Judaism, and a columnist whose op-eds appear in the Huffington Post, Haaretz, and many other Jewish publications. And you can read Eric online at ericyaffe.com. Betty Ehrenberg is the executive director of the World Jewish Congress in North America. And joining us on our panel for the first time is the National Director Emeritus of the Anti-Defamation League, Abe Foxman, who's currently the director of the study for anti-Semitism at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. It is so lovely of all four of you to come and join us. Thank you so very, very much. Um, you were only seven years old. <laughs> Something true. like that, six-day war, okay? I'm in rabbinical school. You're about to go to rabbinical school. I'm a sophomore at Brandeis. So sophomore at Brandeis. Where are you, six-day war? In the beginning of high school. Medium High School, and you? I'm the Director of Middle Eastern Affairs at the Anti-Defamation League. Amazing. <laughs> you remember those days? Oh, yeah. Okay. You heard me, my description. Were you anxious during the days 
the end of May, month of May, 67, leading into June. For those of us, for those of our audience who were too young, what were those days like? Very scary. For very those scary. Of us, those of us who followed the Middle East, followed Israel, followed, very scary. Um, because? Because in the, in the days of May, where it looked like the clouds of war were gathering, and Abba Iban, with his suitcase, began to travel the world from one capital to the other, reminding the world of an agreement they made uh, when Israel and Britain and France withdrew from uh, the Suez Canal, that it will never, never again be blocked or blockaded, etc. And he went from one capital to the other and received absolutely no response, no promise. And so it became very evident that a war will come and that all these people who said that they will stand up. So it was a scary moment, an existentialist moment. It reminded all of us how vulnerable Israel was. It wasn't clear where the United States would be, whether it would stand by and what ha would happen. Um, were you worried, Abe, for Israel's existence? Yes. Uh, those were the days of the rumors of thousands of graves being prepared um, and, and, and waiting of hoping for a miracle. Okay. But wait, you describe it so well. You're also at Brandeis. I, you know, what was it like on campus? What did you feel as were you aware of it? To the extent that you were aware of it, what did you feel? First of all, I was terrified. Uh, absolutely terrified. You know, sometimes we assume that, you know, what, what happened had to be. It didn't have to be. We could imagine a scenario that would have been very different. Uh, I asked Dave, were you worried for the existential existence of Israel? Absolutely. And I was, I, I had started my college career at Stanford, and I'd left Stanford because I was looking for a, a Jewish community, I was looking for Jewish studies. I went to Brandeis, I studied with Israel and Hebrew language and the Holocaust, not something easy to do in 1967. I really didn't find the community that I was looking for until we uh, got near the date of the Six-Day War. Uh, th there was this panic that really gripped everyone at Brandeis. Brandeis at that point was, you know, 70 to 80 percent Jewish, and you couldn't walk through the campus without feeling this tension. And what was extraordinary from a number of us got together and said, we need to go. You thought of going. We need to go. And look, we weren't, we weren't going to be military heroes. We weren't going to carry guns. But uh, Israel had mobilized. And as, as we know, they couldn't remain mobilized indefinitely because they, they needed people to do the civilian jobs that weren't being done. So at that point, they were looking for volunteers. And one of the places that they talked to, not surprisingly, was Brandeis University. Uh, and Brandeis was extraordinary. As, as students got together, uh, you know, I was one together with many others, and we talked about going. Brandeis helped us. Um, they helped us make the arrangements. They sent a philosophy professor to talk with us about what it would mean to help Israel at this critical moment. We didn't have the money. Um, so they, I walked down to the, the financial office at Brandeis, and they gave me a piece of paper. We will loan you $650 for the plane ticket. You'll repay it within a year. I signed the, uh, the piece of paper, and they gave me the money. Um, so Brandeis, in its entirety, uh, became an institution that was looking towards the Middle East and trying to help in support during this potential catastrophe. Did you go? My uh, flight was scheduled for the 7th of June. Ah. <laughs> and uh, war broke out on the 5th. And uh, so they, they didn't need us at that, at that point. We considered whether it was worthwhile going. I ended up going for the first time in my life the following summer. Um, but uh, okay, yes. You described so well the emotional reality of that month of May leading into the beginning of June. You're in high school. Yes. Um, we you're are, a bit younger, but young. do you remember it at all? Wh which high school? Yeshiva University High School for okay. Girls of Manhattan. Okay. What was the you know, mood We were then? frightened to death. 
our parents were Holocaust survivors, and we were the first generation after. And we felt very acutely what our parents were feeling as they listened to the news on the radio and watched the news on TV. Uh, the school was very, very tense. They let us bring a TV, and we watched Abba Ibn televised. Uh, we watched the UN proceedings that were televised. And we were nervous and scared. We grabbed the blue boxes off the kitchen counters and ran into the streets. And thinking that, you know, quarters that would help, uh, you know, the JNF were going to somehow save the day. But we thought that we could lose Israel. We were worried for the existential reality of Israel. Yes, we were. Yes. There was no, there was no feeling yet that Israel had uh, become a bar kayama in the sense that she was still fragile from 1948 and 1956, and what was yet to take place did not yet happen, and so we still lived with that idea of a fragile yes. state, tinier than New Jersey. And, and I want to remind our viewers, it's not just Egypt with 130,000 soldiers on Israel's south. There's also Jordan to the east, and there's Syria to the north. Israel is surrounded by hundreds and, and of Iraq, thousands and Iraq, Iraq, and Iraq mobilized Iraq. troops. Exactly right. You're only seven years old. You Don't count me out. Oh, I'm not <laughs> out. Okay. I was You're a precocious seven-year-old. Seven <laughs> As you are to this day. Okay. I have, I have a great seven-year-old story. Give me it. My Israeli cousin, Shimon Vered, was staying with us during the Six-Day War prior to that. He was one of the first wave of Israeli good-looking sabras that came to New York City, got jobs, and dated wildly. Uh, you know, love this country. Uh, and he, he was working in, as a shoe manufacturer or something. And he, I was seven years old, and he was six foot two. And he had fought in the 56th War. And as a seven-year-old, I remember this is what was so crazy, is that he was already having me do push-ups and sit-ups as a seven-year-old. My parents were Holocaust survivors. They invited this nephew in, and look what he was doing. And then, sure enough, a war breaks out. Mm -hmm. And we actually watched television, the news, each day with, with, our, with my cousin, uh, Shimon. Uh, and he was ev and every day ready to be deployed. He, was he never actually, you know, the story of people who never got out in time is ridiculous. How it gives you a sense of how incredibly short-lived this war took place. But as you were talking and as you described, you know, the image of the old Jew, I'm thinking, well, when I was seven years old, my impression of Jews at this point were not even my elderly Holocaust parents, uh, but my cousin Shimon, who had already fought in a war and lost a brother in a war, that he had his only brother lost in a war, and was ready to be deployed. And he was among other Israelis who were living here at the time, who'd served in war, who were either heading back or on the way to be back. And I think it did create in my mind an impression of this being a new world. And of course, the euphoria, which we'll all now talk about, about what happened in the immediate aftermath of that was extraordinary. But it, the war, remember, this was not an age of internet. You know, you were still relying on newspapers. You were relying on Walter Cronkite at 6 o'clock to tell you. It wasn't like you had all day news. Uh, and so the war was going fast, but not as fast as we would have seen it today because we would have actually watched it today. But I think it did, cre it did create at least a sense among American Jews of a solidarity with Israel that didn't really exist for many segments of the, of the American population. Yeah. Hold that thought for one minute. But when I'm in rabbinical school, I'm in the first year. I remember listening on radio mm -hmm. and with, with other rabbinic students. And I was literally scared that this was going to be the end of the state of Israel, and it was you know, it was founded only 20 years earlier. It would only be a 20-year Jewish experiment. Mm -hmm. And I also remember, and any of you can, I, I wonder if this resonates with any of you, I remember Abba Ivan. I remember the voice. I remember him sitting in the United Nations. I remember him speaking throughout the entire build-up and then during the Six-Day War. And for me, the voice of Abba Ivan and the eloquence mm -hmm defending the state of Israel, and there was quiet outrage, moral outrage, that the world was permitting this to happen. It, it was stirring to me. Again, I don't yet know the end of the story, but I remember thinking to myself, this is a contemporary Jewish hero. You remember any of that? Yeah, it was a sense of pride. Yes. Um, here was this Jew <laughs> with a British accent. Gorgeous. Speaking English better than 
all the others who pretended that English is their language and um, proudly, proudly defending. But it was also, the other side of it was the scary moment because it built, as you said. It, it didn't happen. It was not an instant event, an attack. That was, we were living, we were getting closer to it. And every day that went by and there was no no resolution and nobody stood up and there was no diplomatic anything, um, the anxiety grew. And I would say, Mark, that that was the greatest impact on the American Jewish community. Um, what Thane says in the solidarity, before the 67 war, the American Jewish community was Zionist and non-Zionist, uh, you know, and, and the a Zionists majority, cared, and majority were which? Were a Zionist or non-Zionist. Exactly right. And uh, they didn't care. So there was a small segment who worried about exactly. Israel, who cared about Israel, who lobbied, who raised money, who was ready to go, and the rest, okay. Right. The months, the six day, weeks really leading up to the war, every single day removed the barrier. And the, the non-Zionists, the a-Zionists, and even the anti-Zionists began to feel this, this, this fear, this existential fear that this thing, which you know, made them feel good, made them feel proud, even though they, they didn't get engaged in it, may, God forbid, disappear. And with it, another Jewish tragedy. And it removed the differences between Zionists, non-Zionists, pro-Israel, anti-Israel, et cetera. And it, and it lasted for a long time. And that was another of the miracles. Absolutely. Want to comment on that? The, the masses of American Jewry, as Abe said, had this kind of ambivalent relationship. I mean, a, a, a sense of connection, but not necessarily strong. What's interesting, though, is even among the intellectual leaders and even among the rabbinical leadership, now, Commentary Magazine has run this, these uh, symposiums over the course of the last 50 years. I've written in a number of them. The very first was in 1966. And it had its first symposium on the state of Jewish belief, and it went to all the recognized intellectual leaders of American Jewry. Go back and look at that today, and it's fascinating. I mean, of, of all points of view, well, first of all, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, and, and secular, and communal, and so on, Israel is hardly exactly. mentioned. Exactly. It is hardly exactly. mentioned by anybody. Yes. It is simply not part of the intellectual agenda of those who led the American Jewish community in 1966. Yes. And everything changed the following year after the war. Everything. It is a sea change. It is an absolute sea it's, change. Yes. And now, I mean, other things were going on. I mean, I think we have to reckon, you know, you had a convergence of a variety of factors. Other things were happening in American society. But there's, without any question, you know, the, 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 the turning point here. Uh, the, the match that sort of created the, you know, the, the flame, this burning flame of Jewish commitment, it came from the events surrounding the Civil Rights It was the Absolutely. Civil Rights Movement era, you know, 64, 65. Jews were very much involved in the community, but their issue was civil rights. Right. It was not Israel. It was not Israel. And I thought you said it very well. There was a strong pro-Zionist core in the Jewish community, but the vast vast American Jewish community was only tangentially involved and committed to the state of Israel. But it had other repercussions. Um, we watched Abba Ibn and we had pride and, and we put, us, put almost all our hopes into this man. We also watched Baruti, the ambassador from Saudi Arabia, who berated Israel. We it was our first taste of really finding anti-Israel at the United Nations. We had always, you know, the United Nations had a piece in creating, bringing the State of Israel into being when it uh, voted to accept it as a member. Now here was something else, uh, the Zionist entity in occupied Palestine. That was the erase your name, we'll erase you. Um, there was something else after that, that was a sea change. Um, we began to see Israel as strong 
with all these possibilities. Yes. And it had a profound influence on my parents and on the Holocaust survivor generation. Really? Because up until then, most Holocaust survivors, or many Holocaust survivors, did not speak about their experiences. It was still too painful. It was still too soon after the Holocaust. It was still not something they wanted to have their children hear about. And afterwards, they started to say what had, about what had happened. And it was, that was a sea change. That's interesting. As a survivor, does that resonate with you at all? As far as a child uh, Yes, I think, I think that we forget that how, um, even though Israel had won prior two wars, they were really a footnote in the Middle East. That's right. By the way, what you say is so important. Even the War of Independence oh. and the establishment of the state did not affect us. And it did not resonate as this is a country that defends itself against combined enemies. And remember, the War of Independence, I think 10% of the population was killed. I mean, people forget the numbers. Imagine, you know, you just, but you declare your statehood, you're celebrating, and then there's a war by kind of combined our Arab armies, and then 10% of your population, which already at that time was under a million people, right? I think it was 800,000 people. Oh, it was 600,000. 600,000. 600, 600, Imagine, died. think of the sheer numbers. So even though there had been two victories, Nobody thought of Israel as a player, as yes. a power. Yes. It would never occur. And by the way, the Israelis themselves, when we read all the historical accounts, they had no idea that this was going to be over in six days. That's correct. They thought their lives could be over in six That's days. That's correct. So even in themselves, everyone yes. had a complete reorientation of what Israel meant to that region and what yeah, the Israelis were capable of. Be want, want careful this about 56. 56 was not a victory. 56 was not a great moment for Israel. It right. was, they didn't win. They didn't take the canal. America forced a withdrawal. It hurt the image of Israel, that it was playing with colonial powers, trying to maintain the old system. So uh, 48 no was, about 56, 56 right. nobody wanted to talk but about I, it. I want to know from all of you, why do you think it is, and again, this is a, a moment of digression, why is it that while there was undoubtedly a core of American Jews who, for whom the establishment of the State of Israel was, again, in their lifetime, a miracle. For the vast number of American Jews in the 1950s, in the early 60s, prior to 67, Israel was not the focus of Jewish life. The fact that you quote a commentary symposium and Israel is almost absent it would be unthinkable today. And I, I want the audience to understand, if you were younger than, if you were too young to be aware or there in 67, the way Israel is now at the center of so much of Jewish life, it wasn't that way at all. And I'm wondering, why do you think it was in 48? Part of in 48, it didn't have the impact that 67 had. It was part of insecurity. I remember where the American Jews were in 48. They were still struggling to get into college, fighting quotas, getting jobs, in the neighborhoods, etc. They were not, we, we tend to look at the Jewish community through the prism of who we are today. It was a community struggling to, you know, to exist. There was a sense of insecurity about their loyalty. And what you had in the reform movement, the reform movement would did not recognize Israel. In fact, the birth of the Council of, of Judaism, the anti-Zionist movement on an intellectual world, it just came out of the reform movement, which was the strongest growing religious element. In addition to which, what I would call the Urim Vitumim of American Jews, the New York Times, this was, you know, this is where Jews learned to be Americans. This is where Jews assimilated. That newspaper was opposed to the establishment of a Jewish state. So that's, that's the environment that they grew up in. And it shouldn't come to us as a surprise that came in 67, they woke up to realize that all of a sudden it will make a difference about them. And the idea that, that one would be a Zionist or one would become a pioneer of a new nation in a desert, you know, this was not the startup nation. Mm -hmm. This was a nation that was trying to figure out how to grow grapes and olives, right? So, you know, it didn't have the appeal. And I think that our, our and also the Holocaust played a huge role in this because although on one hand you would think everyone would focus on Israel, on the other hand the idea was 
that America actually would be the only truly safe refuge. And I think everyone counted on that. But I do think that it just didn't have the appeal. There was a certain kind of a person. Mm -hmm. Everyone else was a fanatic. 66-day war changed everything. Changed everything. And we have to say a word about the reform movement here. <laughs> um, it's, it's true that there were elements of the reform movement. The American Council for Judaism was uh, uh, created in 1943, and it represented the, the, the strong anti-Zionist you know, part of the reform movement, particularly in the South and Southwest, but Chicago and other places as well. Uh, it is, of course, true that a segment of the Orthodox world Absolutely. was also strongly anti-Zionist. In other words, the, the heart of the Jewish establishment both Orthodox and Reform opposed the establishment of the Jewish state. Yes, that that was a reality. Both changed directions, came around, embraced the state, and so on. And uh, I mean, to say the obvious, uh, the two great leaders of American Zionism were Reform rabbis, Stephen Wise and Abba Hillel Silver. Exactly. Right. So, I wouldn't say that the heart of the Orthodox community. There was an uh, establishment. There was the Mizrahi, which had already long since established roots, I would say they were much more indicative and representative of who the Orthodox community was at the time and still. I think the, the, those on the Orthodox, uh, in the Orthodox community that are on the margins of anti-Zionism were then and are now. Uh, we give uh, too much weight to those because they're vocal and, and they're so visual uh, when you see them, but it's not. Okay. Uh, 1948 maybe is not today. We'll read The Chosen. We get a little bit of background there. <laughs> um, but I mean, well, broadly well, speaking, well. I agree with, with what Abe was saying. You, you have a community that was in the process of moving out of the cities, establishing itself Being accepted. As, as a suburban community, uh, a suburban synagogue community, generally speaking, all streams. Uh, that that process happened, uh, you know, between say '48 and the, the middle of uh, 1960s, where literally something like seven, eight hundred American synagogues were were built in American suburbs. And then, as we got into the '60s, the '60s, you saw this ethnic revival that affected not only us but others as well. It certainly affected Black Americans, uh, but affected uh, Jews. And we saw many manifestations of this more intense, vibrant form uh, of Jewish expression. But uh, Abe is uh, right, hold, though. Hold, hold, hold. Okay, I don't want to get into institutionalism. The, the bottom line was that prior to World War II, you are correct, the reform movement was formally against the establishment of a Jewish state or a Jewish homeland, and the reform movement was committed to being a religion, and there was no peoplehood. After the Holocaust in World War II, there was a, a 180 within the Reform Movement. And you were also correct that there was a strong movement within Orthodox. No, it was one, 180. Uh, it's, it may I'll be 120, 120 today. You'll go with 120. I'll go with 120. 120. No, 120. No, I know excuse my own. Me, excuse <laughs> you know me. Your own. You're both wrong. There was a platform at the CCAR which took the exact opposite position. Not a 120, a 180. And lo and behold, the first rabbinical school to ever require students to study in Israel before coming to study for the rabbinate was the Reform Movement, mm -hmm. then the conservative movement. So the, the reality there, is there the a, Jewish community moves. The, but at the, what I'm saying was I had an early interview after we started, I started doing L'Chaim, and I interviewed Paul Kedar, who was the Israeli consul general, lovely guy. Uh, also involved in Bedat Fusot. And I, and I remember this so vividly. He once said to me, and I remember it vividly because when he said it, I said to myself, oh, he's right. He said to me, Mark, there should never be a Jewish event in America where Hatikva isn't sung. Why, is it, why don't Jews in America sing Hatikva any time there is a gathering for a reason? And at that time, Hatikva was almost never done. Okay, I want to come now. We heard how scared you were, how scared Brandeis was, how scared your community was. You don't seem so scared because you got your cousin there. But whatever. We did have a different okay, sense of whatever. fighting Israeli Jews. But, but you have said, Israelis didn't expect this. No. Okay. What happens, and try to recall, what was the emotion when you, you experienced when you begin to realize within the first 24 hours 
Israel's not going to be destroyed, and something extraordinary has happened. Where were you? What do you remember? Well, I, I was at my work desk now trying to shore it up. But uh, I think most of us saw a miracle. It means those of us who were close to Israel understood its vulnerability much deeper than the people who, okay, there may be a war, et cetera. And so when, when the victory happened, to many of us, it was a miracle because we knew the reality of the forces, the arms, the world situation, et cetera. So, you know, it was a, a not a euphoria. Yeah, it was a combination of two things. The Israeli people fighting for their life, fighting for their existence, and the miracles from the Rubina Shalom. Believing or non-believing Jews, so that the, a miracle, you can explain a miracle any way you want. There was a sense of relief. I think most of us at that time thought this was the war that will end all wars Absolutely. in Israel for its existence, for its well-being, et cetera. Point made, how right? how long we, yes. man, we were. What, what 73. You, what, what do you remember? You're at Brandeis. You didn't get to go, and all of a sudden, what? <laughs> right. Pride. There's this, this tremendous pride that we felt. Uh, first of all, uh, pride in Israel and in and her soldiers and in her leaders and the way that they conducted themselves. I mean, the Eban speech that I remember was the one that he gave after the war at the United Nations. I remember standing in front of the television, just awed by his eloquence, and the force and the logic um, and the compelling power of, of his words. I mean, to me, in some ways, that, that remains, you know, the, sort of the dominant uh, image uh, that, that I had. And uh, this tremendous desire to, to get to Israel. I mean, that, that you know, I, I, I didn't have a chance to go, and I felt that, that you know, my, the, the purpose of my life now was to, to get to Israel and to see this place and to be a part of it. It took me a year to do it. Um, but it, it really sort of gave you know, shape to my Jewish did, aspirations. Did you know you were going to be a rabbi at that time? I did not. Did it, have, did it play all, at all into your decision, or were there totally different issues that prompted you to become There's a rabbi? There's absolutely no question that what happened, the events surrounding the Six-Day War made me Jewish in ways that I had not been before, that it pushed me in the, the you know, it immersed me in Jewish studies, it, it pulled me into the Jewish community. Uh, it created all kinds of emotions that I had to sort of deal with and, and analyze. Um, so my, my decision to become a professional Jew, to enter the rabbinate, to immerse myself in religious studies, was, in, in my view, a direct result mm -hmm. uh, of, of this war and what flowed from it. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction? How did you feel? Try to remember, I remember what you really felt. Remember, we thought it was a... Um, we felt it was a miracle. Uh, we, we were, that was our first and foremost thought because it seemed like it, it was unbelievable. They were faced with extinction and this look at what happened. There was this pride, as Eric said, absolutely. Uh, my parents got on a plane right away. I have a picture of my parents, my father with a Kovat Temple. They're standing in the dust. It was, there was no paving in front of the hotel, and there they are. And I have another picture of them with my cousins uh, from Haifa who served in the army. They were in Konetra at the time, and there is that picture. And, and it made a big change amongst all my friends in Yeshiva University High School for Girls. We wanted to go to Israel for a year after high school. And that was a big thing. That was new in the, orth in the modern Orthodox community, at least. We are uh, a year in Israel uh, after high school started to become something that everybody wanted to do, which you nudged and budged your parents to allow you to do, which wasn't easy, especially if they were Holocaust survivors. Um, but it was something, it made a big difference. There were people in City College already taking Jewish studies classes I had never known before. Uh, anyone had ever told me that there was a Jewish studies program at City College. But then, yes, Ellie Wiesel and Yitz Greenberg were teaching. That's right. And uh, th that was new. It was new. It came with the ethnic pride. But it also came as a result of that. And, um, and yes, it made a big difference. We had records from Israel. We always had records from Israel in my house. It had a big part to do of, what I, of why I was a Zionist, the music from Israel. 
and there were these songs that were played, the Six Day War songs. Name uh, some of them. Rabin, ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Natsa's waiting for Robin. Let him wait. He says, Shayyachakeh v'lo yezuz. We went that summer as soon as we can get, my wife and I. Couldn't get a room <laughs> in the old, in the new old Jerusalem. And the only room we got was in, uh, on the other side. My wife was not comfortable. Um, and then we got somebody to bring us a, somebody was coming, a suitcase of pampers. I, br I took that suitcase to Ron Fetterman, Fetterman's son, who just had a baby. And that <laughs> suitcase of Pampers gave us a room at the King David. <laughs> but look, Who's there was Ron nothing. Fetterman? Fetterman was the owner of the King David, right. and Don Shane. <laughs> but there was nothing like, you know, we, we, we take for granted today the cocktail on the Western Wall and uh, walking through the alleys then. And then when you approach the wall, there were no plazas, there were no squares. It was there you were and you looked up and it was huge, huge, huge. And uh, the emotion, the emotion, uh, all of a sudden straight. you connected You're with 2,000. at the wall? You How soon after two, the war? Uh, two weeks. What an experience. Wow. But uh, then you felt the connection of 2,000 years of Jews. Absolutely. Longing for so Jerusalem. So you're seven years old. Do you remember how you felt? I remember a lot of things that continued on. I mean, remember, this is sort of the era of the end of the bookish Jew. I mean, I think that this idea of the Vishniak Lithuanian Jew, this ended with the Six-Day War. A, it, a new image, right? Uh, this was like Benny Leonard, Hank Greenberg, Sid Luckman on crack. Yeah. By the way, like, this I, was I want to put it up here. I want to put up the picture again of the woman soldier, which I believe that became yeah. the image of the Jew. That replaces Vishniak's Jew. Absolutely. That picture. That one, and of course, you, you remember the, the famous cover of Life magazine mm -hmm. with the Israeli soldier the three, the three crossing, three the, crossing the, the Suez. Suez Canal, carrying a captured Egyptian rifle yeah. across the Suez Canal, a smile as large as can be. That becomes an iconic Life magazine. And the other picture you just mentioned is the picture of? The three paratroopers who that retook when they retook the wall. Remember, the wall was called the Wailing Wall until that moment. You know, we all grew up calling it the Wailing Wall. All of a sudden, it's the Western Wall and the Kotel. Why? Because it, it gets brought back to Jewish hands. But the faces of these three young paratroopers at the wall is really it's just a, a shocking image to talk about this, you know, it's the ultimate Jewish comeback. Right? Somehow even the independence of Israel is not quite the same because this wasn't just a victory. <laughs> this is beyond a victory. First of all, when you think about the Suez Canal, you're talking about you know, the, the old city, the Golan Heights, but most especially the Kotel. Uh, this was people, most people, you, most people as you know can't find Israel on a map. But if they could find it on a map, it wouldn't occur to them that, that the wall wasn't at, at, always at, ours. Always right. ours, was, right? They always assume. You couldn't go. And so to, the, the idea that this was just, it was a knockout. Do you re also remember the photograph of three Israeli ranking soldiers walking into the old city? Dayan. Dayan is one. Yeah. Uzi Narkis. Uzi, Uzi Narkis is right. two. And, and uh, Rabin. And Yitzhak Rabin. Yes, absolutely. A young Rabin. Dayan with the patch, and right. Uzi Narkis, who was the head of the Israeli army fighting against Jordan and trying to liberate the old city of Jerusalem. Right. Again, an iconic picture for you? Yes. yes. This is there the was very another early picture moments. of Rabbi Gorin. Yes. With the shofar. Yes. At the Kotel. Yes. Saying Shechianu. Yes. The first time back. we blow the shofar yeah. again yeah. from the days of the Maccabees, Shekhi. practically. Wow. Yes. Har habayat biyadenu. Yes. Matagur, a secular Jew. Right. Har habayat biyadenu. Which means? Uh, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Yes. And that was broadcast all over. Every Israeli soldier right. heard it all over. A, a fabulous, fabulous moment. Barak recently wrote about the fact that I think he was in the Suez, Ehud Barak. <laughs> and and he, oh, he heard this and he said, I was a totally secular Jew. Yeah. A totally, a completely secular Jew. And I heard those words.
and transformative. And right. They, 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 you know, they just into the heart. Yes, right, into my heart. So I talk about that now for a moment. I want to now talk about how American Jewry changed because of the Six Day War. What happens to American Jewry afterward? How do you, how do you, for those who weren't there, what's the difference? We take it for granted. That's what Abe's point was. We take for granted that this is what Jewish life was all the time. Before 67, it was not. What happens? The most important thing, I think, is, is a community that had not been assertive became assertive. Yes. On all fronts. On all fronts. That had a, you know, a self-image. Yeah, political action. You know, that, that uh, wasn't necessarily weak, but was retiring. And all of a sudden, with this new sort of sense of self, this new image of themselves that went hand in hand with the image that they had of, of, of Israel and the new Jew in Israel, began asserting itself. That meant began asserting themselves politically on Israel's behalf, very important. I mean, APAC and the whole complex of pro-Israel organizations, which had been you know, relatively ineffective until then, started to become strong and powerful. But beyond that, we became assertive in all aspects of our, our lives. The, the civil rights legislation that had passed a few years before opened all kinds of doors. And American Jews then started marching through those doors uh, aggressively. Jewish studies found its way into the, the curriculum. Holocaust, which, as Thane had indicated, was barely part of our consciousness. Betty said, said the same. All of a sudden, Holocaust education became normal, became part of popular culture. Everywhere you turned, we started to sort of struggle with and try and come to grips with issues uh, of, the, of the Holocaust. Uh, you know, look, uh, uh, African Americans started using the phrase, black is beautiful. All of a sudden, young Jews said, you know, being Jewish, is reasonably attractive. <laughs> and, and, uh, Kiss me, they, I'm Jewish. They, they, to some extent, took their cues Absolutely. from blacks. Absolutely. Which is fine. They, they went charging through the doors that were now open to them. You celebrated, one second, you celebrated, as you, you know, you celebrated 50 years with the ADL. Um, how many years as national director? 28. 28. You basically started the ADL roughly at the Six Day War. Okay. So you were there also in a specific, in a very unique position to see the change in American Jewry. I want you to speak to me about the change you experienced after the Six Day War because of the different image the Jew had of himself, the American Jew, because of what Israel did. Yeah, we stopped rationalizing. Before the 67 war, uh, we had to rationalize. Why are we supportive of Israel? We had to worry about dual loyalty, what people were saying. I remember our whole program, support of Israel, was based on the boycott. Why are we for Israel? Because Israel's being boycotted. American Jews are being boycotted. If they support this discrimination of Jews because of Israel. After 67, you didn't have to look for rationale and explanations. It was clear um, what Israel meant, what we meant to Israel, that our faith, the sense of pride that we're talking about, it's when the non-Jews would say, boy, your army, you know, it wasn't our army. But all of a sudden, it was good to hear when somebody, you know, filling a gas tank, oh, you know, don't you love Israel? Uh, okay, it became natural. I, I want to sort of disagree with that, maybe the three of you. Um, I think we're putting too much on the changes in American Jewry. There was a major change, and it dealt with the issue of Israel, with Zionism, with comfort and political action. I, mean, I, I don't think it went to, I think, Holocaust education and all kinds of other reasons. It had denial. It had the mortality. It had uh, NBC's Holocaust. There were a lot of reasons that the civil rights movement opened doors, and, but I, I don't want to put it all on, on, on the 67 war. I think the 67 war was a cataclysmic change in the view American Jews, at least for a generation. Had of? Had of Israel, and their affinity, their closeness, their ability to stand up. They weren't looking behind their shoulder. There was no issue so of double loyalty. So it changed their own 
it's their own self-perception. It helped that the outside world yes. saw this wonderful yes. magnet. But I wouldn't go this far in terms of courses on Judaism. And all. That, there were other revolutions. There were other revolutions going on. Black is beautiful, but you do, you do caused and, 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 and made Jewish is beautiful and Irish is beautiful. But it had nothing to do with the 67 war. I think the 67 war is worth a lot, but let's not, let's not burden it with all these changes in you, our society. And you don't think it helped? What? That's all Eric said. I'm just simply helped. saying there's a convergence of yeah. factors. Right. Okay. <laughs> it was timing, but not necessarily. Yes. But, yes. Yeah, but the convergence of factors was due to a new confidence in the Jew, and I think that really was as a direct result of the 67 war. Don't forget, after the 67 war, we didn't have certainly not right away. What we have now is all this criticism of Israel and this resentment of Israel and this BDS and all of that. of that. They, they admired you. By the way, uh, people would tell us all the time how much they admired yeah. Israel. You, Lucky as, Israel. As, as somebody who's involved in the World Jewish Congress, who was the David and who was the Goliath? At the time, Israel was the David and the Arab world was the, the uh, Goliath. Egypt, sure. The United Arab Republic. The United Arab Republic. The Pan-Arabism. It yes. was uh, everybody ganging up. And I remember all of the ways in which I was proud of the conduct of the Israeli army. I was proud that Rabin goes to Mount of Olives and wants to take cottage for the Egyptian soldiers. I'm proud of the book The Seventh Day, which comes out where Israelis who fought in the Six Day War write these extraordinary letters. Siach lo chamim. That's what it was in Hebrew. Which before. is being challenged today. Right. Yeah, by the way, that everything, aside, every, you know. That's the whole thing. It okay. What's new? But an, okay. extra, an extraordinary book, Wasn't I it? agree. Okay. It had and tremendous these, impact. And Israeli soldiers marched down the streets of Copenhagen and Stockholm and, and were greeted with flowers. And, and today, God forbid, if you come with, as an Israeli to any of these capitals. Yes. Well, I, I'm only saying that I, I think that there was a legitimate reason to be proud, not only of the victory, but of the character of the, that young Israeli soldier we just saw up on the screen. And that helped our image, yes? I think I, I would like to speak now as the resident novelist on the panel. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I think what we are, we're not talking about is all great peoples have a military history. Um, the ancient Greeks, the Romans, you know, this is for, for Jews, you think back, you say, well, you know, Joshua led the armies back into Canaan. There's a slingshot somewhere with David. Uh, and of course, Masada, we have these moments. But this had- And the Maccabees lost. Maccabees. And the Maccabees lost, right? The Maccabees lost and the Zealots lost at Masada, right? I mean, these are not victories. This romanticized Jewish life and Zionist and Israeli life in a way that, again, what goes beyond the first number of years since its independence, because it was an extraordinary military victory, because it introduced a military culture that, by the way, Claude Lanzmann en ended up doing an entire documentary on the IDF. And again, so much of the, ID the story of the IDF sort of commences with this pride that comes from this military victory. Because you're right, 56 is not much of a victory. The first war is a victory if you think losing 10% of your population is That's a victory. Not, it just right. wasn't noticed. It's survived. Right. Okay. right. Here, this is a major victory. This is where you would study this in Annapolis in West Point. You, the world was watching. All of a sudden, Israel's Air Force was being treated as qualitatively among the best in the world, right? This is what everyone aspired to be in Israel, a fighter pilot, right? The Jewish doctor, that's good. But first, IDF, right, to be in the Israeli Air Force. So. I just think that as we are like all people on this planet, that there is something very romantic about a military mm -hmm. history, mm -hmm. and that's not something that we associated with Jews until mm -hmm. 1967. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. The protocols just came out of the cabinet meetings before the war, yeah. and they, they talk, uh, w what we read about is the struggles of the cabinet minister, uh, ministers and how reluctant they were. They, to do the preemptive strike. To, do, to, to go to war. That there was the very, very strong voices. You had military people who said, we've reached the point. We're beyond the point. We have got to attack. We have no choice. And the politicians who did not want to go to war, they were afraid of the casualties, they were afraid of the consequences, they did everything conceivable 
to avoid the military option, and then finally they simply had no choice. And then I they mean, paid the price in 73 by not doing what right, they didn't want right. to do. And they learned the wrong lesson from that. Right. But right. it, it they, makes their the 60s, allies were threatening makes them. the 67 were all that much more impressive. That's they were correct. so reluctant. Absolutely. You, at World Jewish Congress, what happens to Soviet Jewry, the Jews of the former Soviet Union, because of the Six Day War? They gather in Moscow. They meet a uh, uh, prime minister of Israel. They are in kindled, and it means everything. Um, it causes a crackdown and a backlash from the Soviet authorities, who were miserable over what had happened. Um, and don't forget, the Soviets at the time were on the side of the Arabs. They were not willing. They were not happy about any Israeli victory. Um, and so, uh, in addition to Holocaust survivors coming out, um, so did now the Soviet Jewry movement start to blossom. But Abe, you've talked about this in the context also of the Civil Rights Movement, that yeah. Jews were very, so strongly right. involved right. in the Civil but Rights Movement, the combination between that and the Six-Day War. But in, in the Soviet Union, where Israel was still a nebuch, why do you want to go to a country which is struggling and may not survive? 67 Change said it. to them, this is a country that's strong. It can defeat the client states of the Soviet Union. And that's when, you know, the Galimir thing, the, 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 the Eli, that's when, they, that's when Israel reached back. They, they, there's a movie coming out shortly, I read this week, on the hijacking, which... There was an attempt at hijacking. Operation Wedding. Right. And we were very, very schizophrenic. You know, do we hijack? Do we not hijack? Is there something? Turns out now it was after the 67 war where they said there's a place to go. It's safe. We can raise our children. And they, they even tried a hijacking. And that Joseph catapulted. Yep. What's yep. interesting is there's no question that the Six-Day War awakens a sense of Jewish identity and Jewish pride among American Jews. It does the exact same thing yeah. in the former Behind Soviet the Union. Iron it, and all of a sudden, <laughs> here you have Jews who barely knew they were Jewish, had no idea what Jewish meant. But all of a sudden, they knew they had a tie to Israel. And it all comes, it just bubbles up and <coughs> erupts into an entire movement. That ultimately yeah, but that's also part of a miracle that, that nurtured for 40, 50 years. That means there had to be something waiting Nothing for this to... Nothing was oh, going yes, on. Oh, yes, it was. They still held on. They still wrote no, songs. they yeah. didn't. They, they didn't. did. Otherwise, you'd well, have nothing to... to it, was, it, it, it was as much of a... It came out of nothing. You had people who would, didn't know what it was, didn't know what it means, didn't know which parent was Jewish or was not Jewish. Would come to synagogue on Jewish holidays, which they didn't practice. They, they stole the typewriter to, to teach Hebrew. They weren't they going were. before 67. Not for Shabbos. They were going Nothing. For, for some chastara no, and Russia. Doesn't That's matter. after 67. <laughs> it's not before 67. Okay. And we should remember the role that the Russians played in Keeping bringing about Jewish. the six, no, in bringing yeah, about the six the day war. I don't know that we mentioned that, but yes. yeah, they were very significant because they spread the rumor right. Right. Yes. that Israel was massing right. troops right. on the Syrian border. The Syrians took that very seriously. Yep. The Egyptians took it very seriously, and an argument can be made that that's what pushed the Egyptians in, into moving troops into Sinai. So, so uh, the, the the Russians were a responsible, and they were particularly furious. Therefore, when they saw that uh, that uh, and they the were Israelis the ones won. who almost forced the Americans to go to Israel's aid. Yes, I want to move to the next step. <laughs> the next step is now Israel wakes up. It has liberated the old city of Jerusalem. It has the Western Wall, but it also finds itself in control of what's called the West Bank. And most people are unaware of, first of all, you mentioned that Moshe Dayan says, we're going to leave the Temple Mount in Muslim hands. That, is, that has repercussions down to this day. But there was also a question as to what Israel would do with the West Bank. And Israel's attitude comes out of what you said earlier. There was a hope that the Six-Day War was the last war. Better said, 
We've been in a war with the Arab world since 1948. There have been a series of battles. This battle, hopefully, was going to end all the war. And so Levi Eshkol is prime minister, a not very well-known prime minister. And Levi Eshkol, who had all kinds of issues of his own, he seemed he, he was less than the most decisive of prime ministers. Levi Eshkol and his cabinet come up with the idea that they could make peace with the Arab world. They were going to say to the Arab world, look, we're going to keep Jerusalem, we're going to keep the Golan Heights for security reasons, but we'll negotiate some kind of new border. You can have the land, you'll have the land, but you'll make peace with us. You will say it's over and we will have a new era. And so the Arab League goes to the capital of the Sudan, Khartoum. What happens at Khartoum? No to peace, no to recognition, no to new borders, no, 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 no to peace. No negotiation, no peace, no, no, no recognition, recognition, no recognition, no, no negotiation. So, yes. so people, the three words would remain the same no matter what order, it's but no, it, was no, no, no. it was no peace, <laughs> no recognition, no negotiation. And at that to point, this day. <laughs> to the, at that point, we enter another phase. And now Israel has a problem. If the Arab League isn't going to make peace, what does it do with the West Bank? And that leads to the problems we have today because now it's not remembered that it was the Israel David fighting so the Arab peace. world Goliath. It wasn't... Nobody remembers that Israel said, we don't want this land. By the way, we want it. And obviously there were those in the state of Israel who would have loved to have Judea, Samaria become part of Israel. But the overwhelming sentiment in Israel was, this isn't about land. Make peace with us. And the Arab world said, no peace, no recognition, no negotiation. What is Israel to do then? Well, and what happens well, as but, a result of that? Well, you, you had another war. You had another war. So um, what the Israelis... Wait a minute. You had about 73? You had a 73 oh, I, war. I got 67 no, to 73. Well, because I want to know what happens now. Now, you <laughs> finally get some of the results of the 67 war, which is peace with Egypt, peace with Jordan. That was, you know, if it wasn't for the 67 war, but you need another war. You need another war where some of the Arabs thought, ah, you know, this time they got it. Now we'll take care of them for good. They still believed. And here's a catch-22. In our Western normal cultural thinking, you defeat somebody, okay, they get the message, and now when you sue for peace, you make peace. The answer is it may apply in 90% of the world. It doesn't apply. The Arab states believe that this was maybe a miracle. Maybe they, they, can, they can do it. And that's why when the Israelis were talking post-67 in London, that all kinds of offers for peace, they were thinking one more shot at the war. So we have to play, play another war to get some of the rewards, but not all of the rewards of victory. Oh, I understand. It's not exactly, though, no, my question. My question is, because I'm there, you're there, you're there. I don't know the first time you go. I don't know the first time you go. I go post-67. I'm going in 1970. Mm -hmm. There is a spirit still. There was a spirit in Israel until 73. And there's an idealism. But I'm asking you, if you can remember, what does Israel do with land, the Arab world says, we're not going to make peace over this piece of land. Well, I, I went in 68, and I, I, I went to study at an Opan, but I spent a lot of time traveling throughout the country. In fact, I, w I went to all the territories that you could go to, which was, at that point, virtually everything. Everywhere, right? Yeah. There was um, no, no limitations. And, uh, Do you remember, by the way, how the Arab, Arab, Arab Israelis treated you? How Arab Israelis treated yes. me. I, I, mean, I remember how Arab Israelis treated me. I remember how how uh, uh, Arabs in the territories treated me. How they me. treat you? Fine. Yes. Fine. They were lovely. 
it was it was not a problem at all. There was no sense that this was an oppressed exactly. people under occupation. Exactly. And in fact, they were happy to have yes. the tourists. They were happy to have the the the. They got rid the of income. Jordan. Israel and, liberated them. And they assumed, to the extent that you know, I was able to either communicate or read or talk to people. They also assumed that, despite so, you know, Khartoum, despite Khartoum, this was going to have a positive uh, outcome. This was going to lead to some kind of a better life, some kind of peace, hopefully. They didn't know exactly what it was, but they had a sense, a clear sense, that their life was better, and they were happy to see me, and they were happy to see everybody else. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. that wasn't the case 20 years later. That's but, right. But at that, at that moment, and it also wasn't a problem. in Israel in general, if you were to ask me, you know, what, what was uh, you know, Israel's mindset in 1968, I would say they didn't have any idea. In other words, there were all kinds of opinions. There was no clear thinking on this. If you look at the cabinet protocols, by the way, immediately after the war, that same document that I mentioned before, you have a lot of people around the table saying, what are we going to do with all these errors? I mean, on the one hand, hoping for peace, but at the same time saying, you know, we have an issue here. What are we going to do about it? They had no idea. But there were those that had a pioneering spirit. They had a whole other attitude. My first visit to Israel was in 1965, and I remember standing with my cousin Shoshana from Tel Aviv at the Mandelbaum Gate because we decided to go to Israel. Tell everybody what the Mandelbaum Gate was. The Mandelbaum Gate, Gate was. was the border, basically, in those days. It was before 1967. Between? It was between the Barclays Bank. And Jordan, uh, Jordan and Israel. Israel. Jordan. I'm trying to remember the exact that location. That separated the old city from, from what the became the new city of Jerusalem. That's right. And, and you could only look over there. You could and look you over there and you saw you the got. bullet holes in the buildings. Right. And you had to be very careful. Right. In 1970. Jordanian snipers. Jordanian snipers. In 1970, I am a kid in this uh, school in um, Jerusalem. Um, it is called Hamachon Lahachsharat Morim Mehagolah. I was training to be a teacher. Abe knows I was a teacher. I did not, did, was not inspired to go into Jewish communal service by the 67 war. And um, <clears throat> I had a cousin from B'nai Barak of all places with a small beard who decided to become a Tzanchan because he was inspired by the 1967 war. Paratrooper. A paratrooper came to pick me up from school one day and take me to see something in the old city, the newly, it was only three years, the old city was being cleaned up. They were cleaning up the, the shuls from having been used as sheep pens and being smelly and awful. And here was something called Nachal Moria. It was called a, an Israeli base of paratroopers in the middle of the old city. Um, uh, young 18-year-olds, uh, living there, building and fixing and cleaning the old city, and uh, I was astonished. I was astonished. It was uh, located where now you have street signs that say Rechov Hatzan Chanim, the street of the paratroopers. And uh, in what sense were you astonished? I admired them so. Mm -hmm. I was so quiet. I said nothing. I couldn't keep even uh, in their company. And because these were people close to my age, and I admired them like you admired that young woman in the picture. Mm -hmm. And I thought something incredible was happening. They are building something. Something here was being, was new. And it was, as you said before, a seat change in that way. And no, n nobody shouted at us when we came into the old city. Nobody called us names. When we went into the old city, and from then on, we used to go all the time to the old city. We went Friday night to the hotel. Nobody was scared to walk through the shuk, any shuk in the old city. And um, it was exhilarating. To answer your earlier question, speaking as a law professor now, um, 1968, what is Israel to do? Well. Legally, nothing. Uh, the, the significance of Khartoum is, you know, the, there's a long-standing rules of international law and international engagement. If you're, if you're being attacked by an aggressor nation and you end up taking land from that nation, you have no under obligation ever to withdraw until there's peace, until there's secure boundaries. So forgetting suing for peace, if not for the settlements, Israel would have had no military occupation, any ob obligation to ever withdraw 
precisely because of what happened at Khartoum. Khartoum was the first uh, vocal expression of, we're not going to recognize you. We're not going to give you peace. We're not going to negotiate. Well, if you're not going to give us peace, we're not going anywhere. Where it becomes complicated, of course, are the settlements. But I think that the Israelis themselves, as you, as you point out, had hoped that this would be their bargaining chip. This would be the last war, because surely the Arabs would want to take the land back. And this is the, the beginning of the language of land for peace, the exchange. And we're going to think about what uh, 67 introduced into the language. The words occupation didn't exist before there. The language land uh, for peace exchange. Resolution 242, things that today are so part of the world's you know, Jewish-Israeli uh, exper experiment. Uh, at that time, I think that they, they were utterly mystified that they had now picked up the Golan, the Sinai, and most of all, the old city. Now, I'm sure at that point there was no thought of returning the old city. Absolutely. But the West Bank was a bargaining chip precisely for the point that you raised, which is, do we want to be responsible for a million Arabs living in the West Bank. Yeah, there was also another notion. If there is peace, Jews can live on the other side. You know, why we're we talking right. about peace with a country that is Judenrein? So even from that perspective, not necessarily a bargaining chip. You've got X amount of hundreds of thousands, a million, two million Arabs, Muslims living in Israel. So if you wind up with 200,000 Jews living across, if you have peace, Hello, there's nothing wrong with it. But that notion existed then. Today, it's a non-starter. Today, it's got to be Mm-hmm. Right, which, which goes to the other idea that when we talk about people supporting the Palestinian cause, no one asks the question that the very thing people complained about with uh, President Trump's Muslim ban is something that is precisely what the Palestinian Authority is requiring for an, a, a, an Israeli ban when it comes to uh, the West Bank. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, this is a complicated topic. I mean, I, I on, on the one hand, I don't disagree with what has been said, but I've, as I've said on this program before, there are elements of, of the settler population who have no interest in simply, uh, uh, you know, right. living in a, a state that is a Palestinian state and is, uh, is under Arab sovereignty. And uh, they didn't go there with that in intention, and that's not their intention now. In fact, they're, they're hor horrified by, by the process. But there are Gazans so, like that, too, uh, Jews so, who lived in Gaza that are no longer living in right. Gaza. So, so the, there's the, a way to fix that. Depends on the that. government. It, it, there's it, a way it, to it, fix that. I'm only, saying, I'm only saying, those of us who went prior to the 73 war, after 67, I experienced what you experienced. The Arab Israeli and the Arab in general there was a sense of we're brothers. Nobody, and what the, eth, the what was said was, I, I now wonder whether it was true, but what was said was the Israeli Arab is thrilled to live in Israel. He's given citizenship. It's a new era. Everybody's together, and, and, and the people on the West Bank gave you no grief, and there was an idealism here. A, what may have been a naive idealism, but there was an idealism here that Israel was the good guy, and Israel's good guy ex this extended also to non-Jews living in Israel, Arabs living in Israel, Arabs living on the West Bank, and something began to change. I want to ask one. one I want to ask a specific question. We come in control of the West Bank. There are many viewers right now who believe that after we control, come into the control of the West Bank, the Palestinian world creates the PLO. Is the PLO created after 1967? 1964. 1964. What do the letters PLO stand for? Palestine Liberation Organization. Not Palestinian. No. Palestine, Libra, and we are not in control of the West Bank at that time. No, we have nothing. What Palestine does the PLO want to liberate? All the lines inside the 1949 borders. Okay. And there were no settlements. There, there were no, were no settlements. settlements. We're talking about Tel Aviv and Haifa and Jaffa. And, and, and Jordan was not considered an occupying power. Right. Correct. But when the PLO has a charter, the PLO charter specifically mentions the West Bank and Gaza. 
as two places it does not want to liberate. But slowly, a problem develops. Because although Israel said to the, to the Arab world, we'll give it back for peace. By the way, I'm uncomfortable by the phrase, give it back. Because Jordan had it illegally. But what it said was, you can have the West Bank for peace. And it'll be the West Bank without, without the Golan Heights, with a different line than the Armistice Line of 49. And there are no, there's no Mali, Mali Adumim yet. There's no Efrat yet. There's no Ariel yet. There's no Kiryat Arba yet. There's, it is, but slowly things change. And we live in a different world. The Jewish community has also gone through an arc. And that's the next thing I want you to speak about for a moment. It's not simply that things changed in the dynamic between the Arab and the Israeli. There is also, they developed a different kind of opposition well, to but, Israel but covered, within American Jewry. It follows, Why? It Why? follows Israeli reality, Israeli policy. I, I want to comment before, I, I think when you talk about the attitude of the Arab Israelis or the Palestinians after 67, uh, in terms of idealism, there was very little idealism. It was very, very pragmatic. They just suffered a defeat. And here come the conquerors. And again, in their history, you, you know, you deal with the conqueror, you placate the conqueror, you make friends with the conqueror. So that was one. Two is, they believe that the Israelis will never leave. The, that means <laughs> they knew, and therefore they were taking out an insurance you work with the Jews, you work with the Israelis, you, you cooperate, etc., and they're not going to leave, they're, they're going to protect you. And, and that changed, too. The moment they began to realize that that may not be the case, all of a sudden it becomes <laughs> dangerous to smile <laughs> to an Israeli or be nice or I'm cooperate. Sorry, why is it dangerous to smile? Because to then you're going to be returned. You're going to be returned to another authority, and that authority is still an enemy. And therefore, you will have been a collaborator. And that be the longer in, in Israel state. Who are you afraid of? I just want to make sure our audience understands. You're afraid of the Palestinian state, which will take a look how friendly you were. So the Palestinian state does not want the Israeli Arab to be friendly to Certainly the Certainly not when there's no peace. Certainly not when there's oh, no there's peace. There's a difference between those and the territories and Israeli Arabs. Correct. So they, yeah. that's a significant they difference. They have other conflicts because they would like to continue to be Israeli citizens but also be Palestinian. Okay. Explain to me, though, the journey you've seen American Jewry take since 67. Look, in 1968 when I was there, and, and I agree with Abe's analysis, there was a, it was a pragmatic approach to a people who had been conquered many times and who were accommodating themselves to reality. But there was a sense in 68 that life was going to get better. And it was going, there would be peace or there wouldn't, but life was going to get better for all concerned. Um, and for a whole variety of reasons, over the course of 50 years, life got better in some ways and worse in other ways. And uh, an Israeli presence became an occupation. And occupations, by definition, ultimately cannot be benevolent. Uh, uh, by definition, they ultimately will become oppressive. Yeah, I, I don't agree with you. I, I, Even if they I, are I, benevolent, I, the, the, to the person experiencing it, it is not benevolent. But he's talking about Jews changing, not... That's and, he's not talking about how Arabs... And so the point is, Jews looked upon this... Uh, a whole variety of factors are, are involved here. I mean, I, I, I look at what's happening now. So first of all, I see some of the groups that are reacting very differently to the war than I am reacting are because they're young people. And they had none of the experiences that any of us had here. It's totally foreign to them. And, you know, to them this is, a, is, a, is an academic subject that what they, they look at and what they see is an occupation. They're opposed to occupation. They think it's inconsistent with democracy. Uh, they think the people there are oppressed. In some ways they are. And therefore, they're opposed in their, their Jewish connections. 
the Jewish associations are not strong enough to help them deal with the difficulties and the nuances mm -hmm. of this situation. Are not strong enough. Are not, are not strong enough mm -hmm. in, in many cases. And their memories don't go back to 60, 48, 67, You're 73. Right. What's okay. your analysis? Well, it little of it is the consequences of American Jew Jewry entering the mainstream. Uh, the very thing that Jews are experiencing now, being considered not really an ethnic minority, but being part of the white privilege, uh, being part of the colonial powers. Uh, American Jewry just has lost that sense of victimhood. Uh, they've lost that sense of powerlessness. Uh, everything we said about what happened as the days led up to 67, that entire experience is gone to them. To them, it's, they look at Gaza and say, but the Israelis have iron dough. They're fighting guys that have rockets that can't shoot straight. And Israelis take very and they're few they're starving. Cats. And they're starving. And you see the death toll pile up. And there's no sense of the Holocaust. There's no sense of the 48 war, the 56 war, the 67 war. There's a sense of Israel as a Middle Eastern power. And there's a sense of, again, I, I hate to call it a kind of you know, I've written this sense of moral narcissism, but it's also a kind of American liberal smugness to say, you know, most American Jews, they've never fought in a war. They've never experienced the kind of danger that Israelis have experienced. They live in whatever suburban bubble they've lived. And to them, it just doesn't look right for Jews to be either occupiers or to be oppressors. And they're responding, again, in a very uncomplicated way, very simplified way to what they see as a death toll. And they see Israelis being uncharitable and f serving in the, again, I, I've said this on your show many times, but this post-colonial narrative that we saw from the Obama administration is very deep in the minds of American liberal Jewry. And so seeing Israel as an oppressor uh, in that colonial context is not hard for them to see. To see the Israel that we were describing is impossible for them to see. They've never experienced, you know, most of these people have never experienced an anti-Semitic joke. You know, they've not really. And if they were, they wouldn't even know. And they wouldn't, or wouldn't even bother them. They yeah. wouldn't even realize it. So I think that all of us, I was listening to, you know, Betty and I are very close friends. We're both children of Holocaust survivors. Abe is a Holocaust survivor. Uh, you know, <laughs> Betty and I know what that felt like, that sense of vulnerability, that sense of Betty's, the best line of the show today was when Betty said, you know, for Holocaust survivors to even send their children to Israel was unimaginable. It was a trauma. It was an unimaginable. <laughs> By the way, to send their children to the movies, you know, in the local movies was, was a trauma. So this is gone. American Jewry doesn't think of that's itself. That's the good news. Yeah, that's the good news. Because so we fought very okay. hard to yeah, get them the, into this that is mainstream. The dark, this is right. the dark side of the mainstream. <laughs> what do you say? Well, it's, it's, um, you know, it, it, there are more elements than that. It's so funny because in some way, you know, this, um, you would expect people who are smug and, and, and who've grown up uh, shielded and in the bubble to um, maybe not be so empathetic to those who they perceive as suffering from lack of human rights or oppression, yet still there's still that old syndrome which is left over from the old days that uh, Jews, uh, there will be Jews who may uh, be millionaires but they'll vote like Puerto Ricans, that kind of old thing. That's, that's, a, that's a really strange quirk um, if all of that is true in the sense that um, telling us now that Jews are part of the white privilege is, for me, part of a, sounds like a racial slur in a certain sense. Um, I didn't grow up privileged. We didn't grow up privileged. Not all of our kids grew up privileged. Uh, certainly not. Um, <clears throat> and it's also more complicated because there's more, t you know, it didn't change overnight. It didn't change overnight. It took a while. There was this, uh, it took a while for the Palestinians and the pro-Palestinians who wanted to see Israel disappear to develop this drumbeat of constant occupation, occupation, occupation. I've said that here also before. Uh, it's a term chosen specifically because it puts Israel in the bad light. It puts you in the Goliath. You, uh, the Russians occupied Czechoslovakia, or they occupied Poland, and so on like that. So it's always the Nazis, the Nazis occupied, occupied Poland, France, right. France right. and the German, yes. and the Russians occupied Czechoslovakia. Yes, and by the way, there's such a difference between the Nazis occupying France or Poland, both in motivation and in treatment. When you say there's no such thing as a benevolent 
occupation. It rankles me because I say to myself, first of all, the word occupation shouldn't be used. And I lived through, first it was liberation. Hold on, hold on. First it was liberation, then it was administration, now it's occupation. Occupation implies Israel wants to be there. Arik Sharon used the word occupation. Yes, he shouldn't I don't have. Care whether he did he, or he not, he shouldn't he's have. He made a mistake. He's entitled. He made a mistake. It was step a great one word, and he's entitled to the As word, and it's the right word. It was you and step I know one in the series of mistakes. Israel doesn't want to be there, <laughs> and uh, we're not an occupier. We we said to them, "It's you can have it. <coughs> Just make peace with us." They said, "No. What are we supposed to do?" I don't understand what anybody thinks we should do. We should minimize the occupation in every way. Well, let, let we me should get minimize that. the occupation in every way. Which we should do everything that, everything that we could do in order to separate while maintaining our security concerns and our military forces as required. Okay, I, I, That's what we ought to be doing. Okay, we're going to okay, negotiate but, the peace but, process but Eric, again in this program. Eric, That's what always happens Eric at Eric Sharon point. listened to you, <laughs> okay? He took your guidance line, hook, and sinker, and he eliminated, quote-unquote, the occupation under Gaza. He pulled back. He destroyed synagogues. He, he dug up graves. He left them with, with uh, greenhouses. greenhouses. He did it to the letter of, he said, okay, I'm leaving you. It's yours. And the result? Rockets. Would we be better off Custom today is if Israel had been the occupier of, of Gaza from the day that Sharon left? Would we be better off today? I want to suggest to you we would not be. But Israel that's would not, not be. That's not. That's I, not the choice. I would like to get that's back to, to Mark's question about the American Jewish community because it wasn't only the drumbeat of, of unrelenting Palestinians, uh, the attitude of putting Israel as the Goliath. It was also what happened in Israel. There was a change in Israel. American Jews, I would say, up to about 20 years ago, let's say, were pretty much much more united on Israel. That you. There was a unity. I would say they were unified on Jerusalem. Today, we're talking about Yerushalayim, Yom Yerushalayim. American Jews are not unified on Jerusalem. And that came about as uh, from a, a kind of an overconfidence, I would say, from Israel. Israeli leaders began to tell American Jews, you don't have to fall in lockstep with whatever is the current government. You can say what you really feel. And started to, I would say, come in and try to um, divide and conquer. You are, uh, reform is like the labor, orthodox is like the Likud, all of a sudden we're being pigeonholed and told that we can say all these kinds of things that really had us fighting with each other, like the Israelis fight with each other, in a way that Israelis can afford to fight with each other in their own land, in their own independent state, in a way that I feel we cannot for, for it to fight with each other in the Galut. We cannot afford div division on Jerusalem. And this is really key to what we are trying to celebrate today. We're almost out of time. I wish we could go forever. So I want a closing comment. Now we come back. The miracle of the Six Day War, as it stays with you, you know, what's the transcending message and transcending experience you have when you think of the Six Day War? Israel has come home. We have come home to Jerusalem. And if we're going through a rocky time, we will emerge yet again. Wonderful. What is your... Well, I, would, I would say what Patty's saying. Harabayit biadenu. Um, the the holy site is in our hands. Okay. And if we didn't have it in our hands, President Trump would not be coming as the President of the United States. And in the first time in history of American relationship with Israel, which is so magnificent, go to the Kotel, which is in our hands. I don't care what they say, what they want to call it. He came to the Kotel, he prayed at the Kotel with the rabbi, with Jews, with Israelis. He put, a, he put his note in there. And to me, that's what 67 accomplished. If 67 hadn't happened, this would not be. So we still have a long ways to go to fulfill our hopes, our dreams, our, our expectations. But you know what? It's in our hands. It's, it's history, Jewish history is being repaired. And we all believe in reality and in miracles. OK, so there you were, a kid at Brandeis. <laughs> and the world was coming to an end.
And now here we are, 2017, 50 years later. What's it mean to you? This is the key. Uh, there's this debate going on in the American Jewish community. Do we celebrate or do we see this as somehow disaster and tragedy? I'm, I'm very troubled by, by the whole question is the way mm -hmm. that it's posed. We celebrate the victory. The first thing, the most important thing to be said is we celebrate the victory. Israel is alive because of that victory. Israel has, has asserted its right to exist and to be the homeland of the Jewish people. Absent that victory, it would be disaster for, for Israel and for the Jewish people as a whole. So we need to affirm that, and then we have to realize, as, as Abe suggested, we have much to do. Mm -hmm. The realities of occupation are there. We need to find a better way to deal with it. Very well said. Last word. Well, the war only lasted six days, but it never ended. And I can't think of another war like that. The War of the Roses, the Civil War. We always, a, we, a war comes to a conclusion. And yet, in many ways, not only didn't end, but it magnified itself on both levels. Israel became a power because of this war and because of the issues that were there that were left unresolved before Israel was created. They're now even more deeper and more complex. I love all of you so very much. Thank you so much for doing this. And again, I wanted JBS to really celebrate with the rest of the Jewish world a 50th anniversary of Real Consequence, and you have made that possible. Thank you, my friend, always. Beautifully done, sweetheart. Abe, thank you so thank very you. much. Eric, thank you. There you have it. Thane Rosenbaum, Eric Yaffe, Betty Ehrenberg, Abe Foxman, all thinking through, expressing their ideas about an event that changed Jewish life, changed Jewish history, changed Jewish identity to this day, and as you've also heard, created problems that we must still deal, deal with, but we will. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas you heard any of our guests express on this special edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. I hope you, in some way, have an opportunity to celebrate this extraordinary moment in Jewish history, the Six-Day War of 1967. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.